Now, you've written about Joe Biden's uh, catastrophic presidency and his shameful weakness in trying to reward Hamas with a two-state solution. You call the two-state solution a fairy tale and among the least successful ideas in the world. Tell my viewers why you don't think um, it's possible, why you consider it a fantasy. Well, the first thing is, is that Western politicians keep talking about the two-state solution, have done all my life, as the magical solution to everything that goes wrong in the Middle East. They always have said left and right, conservative, Labour, they all, Republican, Democrat, they all say the same thing. They've said for years, decades indeed, if you, give, if you sort, have a two-state solution, uh, then everything else in the Middle East will be fine. It was always a fantasy. The, the economy of Yemen is not going to blossom if the Palestinians get given another state. Um, but, you know, they, they, they always said this. And so now what the in very interesting thing that's happening, Rita, is that as Biden gets towards the end of this presidency, Blinken, his Secretary of State in particular, seems to have decided that the two-state solution, solving the, the, the two-state solution issue, which his predecessors tried so hard to do, should be his achievement. And he is sending out mm. Lord Cameron, David Cameron, the British Foreign Secretary, as his sort of front man to float this idea. The problem is the idea stinks for two reasons very quickly. The first is, if the Palestinians were given another state uh, today, it would be seen as a reward for October the 7th. The response of October 7th in the international community, it would be, let's give the Palestinians another state. That just incentivizes terror. The second thing, however, is, as I say in that piece, the Palestinians were given a state in 2005, a state where they had their own free and fair elections, uh, and they voted in Hamas. Uh, and then they stayed in power for 18 years. And Hamas created a terror state. And they were not overthrown and they started a war, mm -hmm. which they're now losing. If they were given another state, yet another state, the Palestinians, this time presumably in the West Bank, all of Israel would be at risk from the same rocket fire, the same terror. I think it's totally, un it's just impossible, certainly now, uh, for such a thing to happen. But I think that it's worth people realizing this and not taking part in this delusion. Now, I've noticed in recent days you've come under fire on X, formerly Twitter, attacked by the left and the right. The left are enraged by your support of Israel and the West, and they've got segments of the right who are also very angry, Douglas, with you, and they're questioning if you can really be for free speech if you're part of a movement to, what they say, curb speech. Tell me about this emergency coalition against hate. Uh, is there an inherent danger in, in trying to define hate and, and seek, seeking to curb speech? And who gets to define hate? These are all very good questions, Rita. No, I'm, I'm speaking in a couple of days in Canada at the launch of this new group. Uh, Canada has its own unique problems in free speech these days. And I think that it's extraordinary what has happened in that country. I spoke there uh, a couple of years ago and made this point. I'll be making very similar points in a few days. Um, my own view is, of course, as you know, that free speech is one of the most important bedrocks of our society. I don't think that it includes uh, freedom to harass and freedom to intimidate and threaten and much more, which is what we have seen in the last number of months in Australia and Canada and Britain and much more. I think that the, the outburst of anti-Semitism in the West in recent months has been documented now, uh, is something that our societies should be ashamed of. I and mean, I don't think we would have allowed it against any other group of people. I mean, if by now there had been repeated violence against, I don't know, Muslims, uh, um, black uh, Brits or anyone else, uh, LGBTQIA plus people, there, there would be an uproar, be front page every day. We, we would be having inquiries into it. The police would be hauled in. But that, for some reason, is not the case uh, when we've had now months in the West of people calling for incitement against a minority, Jews. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think that in that situation, we do have to be clear and think openly and speak openly about where the lines are between actual free speech 
and what is clearly incitement, incitement to violence and much more. I haven't changed any of my views, but uh, uh, I do notice uh, as we go along this path, the number of people who get deranged along the path. Uh, I remain exactly where I have been on this. So are you proposing new regulations or laws to not tackle it's this not issue? To, no, it's not for me to propose new, new regulations. I would just say that in most countries, uh, I particularly think of Britain and America, there are existing laws on incitement, uh, which are very clear, actually. Yes. Uh, my view is that we don't need any more laws. Uh, we, we have incitement laws. It's just that they're not used. Um, and uh, it, it's, it's startling to me. You know, the, the British police the other day uh, didn't act again against a bunch of anti-Semitic protesters, but did act incredibly fast against a very brave Ara young Iranian man who held up a poster in the middle of their demo saying that Hamas is possibly a terrorist group. And my goodness, the crowd attacked mm. that guy and the police arrested that guy in no seconds flat. Now that is insane. It is, and that footage is shameful. I mean, he was holding up a sign <laughs> condemning Hamas, and he was physically assaulted. They were throwing things at him. Multiple of the uh, peaceful protesters were throwing things at him, and the police tackled him, not the people yeah. who were assaulting him. Uh, again, yeah, we've, it's not the first time we've seen that happen. Uh, on a different issue, in Australia at the moment, we are having unprecedented numbers of migrants coming into the country. We're told it's for the greater economic good. It's a message the Brits have had for many years with uh, authorities telling them, well, if you want to get your pensions, we need mass migration. How else are we going to afford your pensions? But there's multiple new reports coming out showing that well, perhaps that's not the case. The Centre for Migration Control has a report out showing British taxpayers have spent £36 billion on jobless uh, legal migrants and international students. And at the same time, the Brits are being told that thanks to an ageing population, they're going to have to retire later and possibly for a smaller pension too. Uh, it's all very interesting data, Douglas, in the lead-up to an election. It's damning, of course, for the Conservative government who promised legal migration in the tens of thousands, which is what it was in the 1990s before Blair opened the gates. Um, they promised to go back to the tens of thousands a year in net migration, and instead we're approaching a hundred. We're, we're approaching a million uh, uh, last year mm. uh, in the UK. Uh, of course, most of the people uh, who, who come because of the, the stupid laws that the Conservative Party have had in. Instead of prioritising high-skilled workers, they've prioritised low-skilled workers and students. So, of course, of course, uh, do not pay, particularly low-skilled workers, do not pay their way. Uh, they are a drain on the state. They take out more in benefits than they put in in taxation and almost certainly always will. Um, as for the idea that, um, that, 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 that you need to import workers, you need to import migrants because of the, the you know, people growing older and all this. I mean, you know, the, the mad thing about this, as I've pointed out for years, is migrants grow old as well. It's an astonishing fact uh, that evades <laughs> yeah. the politicians. And what that means is, is that you just have an ever-growing population uh, that needs an ever-larger migrant uh, um push from below in order to sustain the living standards of the aging population. Um, it's, I, I mean, I, I think it's, it's a very, very inept set of policies we've had. I've written about them for years. I've explained for years why these policies are so wrongheaded. And, uh, and I'm afraid it's one of the, it's, it's a failure of mine and others. It, the, the, the governments didn't take notice. They didn't act on it. And so we have societal and economic consequences that are going to affect everyone's grandchildren. It's akin to a pyramid scheme almost, isn't it, where yeah. you just have to keep yeah. going, you keep needing to generate that economic activity to, to pay for the mistakes you've, you've made in the past. Now, finally, uh, I want to ask you about this. I saw this post on X go viral in recent days, highlighting the practice of uh, Arab slavers castrating their male slaves. This shocked social media, but you've written about this in your book, The War on the West. It's... 
incredible how so few of those who are obsessed with slavery and historic racial grievances are completely ignorant of the Arab slave trade and, and, and other examples of slavery around the world. How can that be? How can you be so preoccupied with slavery and then be completely ignorant about this? Well, because they're not preoccupied about slavery, are they, Rita? They're preoccupied about being against the West. Mm. That, that's their simple drive. You know, the, the, on issue after mm. issue, it's colonialism or slavery or racism or anything else. These people just simply use these things as brickbats to hit the West with. It's no surprise that their so, that so-called research uh, stops at the edges of the West because they're not interested in critiquing other societies. They're just interested in condemning the West. If, if people were genuinely mm. interested in the history of slavery, they wouldn't be able to ignore the Arab slave trade, far larger trade than the European slave trade or the American slave trade. They wouldn't be able to ignore it. But they do, because they're not interested in slavery. They're simply interested in attacking Australia, Britain, America, Canada and Europe. And uh, that's their game. And we just have to see whether or not they get to win that game. I would hope not. Douglas Murray, always a pleasure. Thank you so much for your time this evening.